start? Morning. Uh, before we start for today, uh, I have to correct something. Yesterday when I mentioned PCA, principal component analysis, I had a mistake. I forgot to mention when you apply PCA and you take the, I said the, the value, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I forgot to say you apply it to the covariance data. I mean, you have to first to calculate the covariances and you take the eigenvalues and uh, 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 basically eigenvectors based on the covariance uh, representation of data. If you check it, you will find it uh, online in the material. Sorry about that, but it's a mistake. Uh, IoT, Internet of Things applications and use cases. Uh, the first year I went to the university to do my degree, we had a computer uh, look like this. This is an IBM 360. Would have been probably the size of half of this room, and we had, uh, I think, around a, a dozen of people actually worked in that center to operate that computer. Obviously, the computing power has changed a lot. The smartphones we use and we take them for granted, now they are probably hundreds of ten, a thousand times faster than this, these computers. Uh, some of the like a uh, uh, super computer. If you are too young, come on. <laughs> Thank you, but no. uh, 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 the, some of the supercomputers on, on, on uh, late seventies or eighties. Like, for example, the Apollo uh, 2 uh, mission control uh, module was something like have to look at the I have 64 kilobytes of memory, look at the processing power, and look at how our smartphones have, uh, have changed now, and we are like a thousand times faster, uh, or sometimes much, on a much larger scale than that. And obviously, our uh, computing power and the power of uh, creating integrated circuits and electronic uh, it has been tremendously growing, uh, like the scaling uh, of, and uh, probably you're familiar with Moore's law, every two years we double up the number of the transistors, we put this into integrated circuits, and probably for the past two decades, this has hold, like every, every two years we double it up. At some point, the laws of physics will stop us, I guess. We can make them smaller and smaller to some extent, and at some point we need to come up with something new, maybe I don't know, quantum technology, something which... But this making the uh, processing uh, units more efficient, smaller, cheaper, has obviously allowed us to create uh, more powerful devices, and, have, and has led, I mean, the uh, directly and indirectly to the growth of Internet of Things, because we can uh, basically add it. Uh, now this computing power, communication uh, modules to small sensory devices and put them in the environment and collect data. At the same time, you're also creating very large scale uh, computing powers. This is a picture from the Google's Astronautic Computing. This is the cooling system for one of their data centers. At the same time, you're making everything uh, in terms of computation and sensing smaller and smaller. We're also creating large capabilities of computation. Combination of two obviously gives us uh, new opportunities and thinking of new type of applications and services. But before talking about the applications, uh, uh, probably I'm getting old, I, I thought a little think of the history of when internet started. Like, uh, you all know this, the, the early days of internet mostly was for research or for some, uh, obviously I'll, I'll start with some uh, DARPA projects. But internet really didn't pick up until uh, the interfaces and the interaction of that started improving by introducing of the World Wide Web and made it more intuitive, made it more interactive for people to be able to access and use the pages. And suddenly from mid-90s, you see there's a massive, huge growth on internet. But it's very interesting. People who actually design and worked on the internet, some, actually they themselves sometimes they didn't think uh, the scale of their work will pick up with that such a pace. Like when they were designing, their initial idea was 256 networks will be enough for internet. That now sounds ridiculous. Like uh, probably we are adding thousands or millions of web pages, websites every single day to internet. But people who were designing it not very long time ago, well, is in our lifetimes, around like two, three decades ago. Uh, uh, they still were thinking that network, probably 256 networks will be sufficient. And some of the early generations, some of the, uh, uh, the probably companies would be embarrassed now that they look at their pages, uh, were designed mainly for like showing information and, uh, and the very early generations were mainly designed for human interaction to be able just to show the text and over the years we have really 
tremendously have seen a lot of progress in creating applications which can actually analyze the data on the web, automatically interpret the data, find the right set of information for us, and allow us to access better to information. I think in the Internet of Things, we are more or less, if you take an analogy, we are in the early days of the, how the web and internet look like. Still, we are building some of our infrastructures. We are thinking of how we make the data accessible. Some of the systems we have are still, uh, and some, sometimes they look very crude. And I think, a lot, like when I say crude, it means they look, look like still we are building them up and we haven't got to a stage which we can really scale, scale them massively. And I think if you take an analogy, probably Internet of Things, in, in many ways we are where the web was in its early days. It's still its early days until we really find some really good applications, some really good scenarios which then suddenly so our applications might really scale up. Uh, uh, some of you might remember, uh, uh, well, Yahoo is still around. Uh, 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 the Yahoo, but, but some of the early search engines on the internet uh, uh, were uh, like probably Yahoo and Altavista were the popular ones. What could remember Altavista? Yeah, like you know, many of you haven't seen Altavista. You don't look like them, but <laughs> <laughs> I look <wish> younger. <laughs> But if you're interested, Yahoo's initial search engine uh, uh, was uh, the very early uh, generation was a, a Linux grep function. You know, grep allows you to search for strings in the file. And basically, what they were do used to do, they used to dump all the pages on the internet to a server and then run a grep function. Forget about any ranking. That was the very early stages of search engines. And they basically, the pages come to a server, they run a grep function, and they should uh, and send it to you. Now, over the years. Uh, obviously, some of the other search engines are ending Yahoo itself started improving, like started uh, adding more, uh, uh, looking at the text, looking at the variables in the text, prioritizing, adding some rankings, so on. And AltaVista was one of the popular ones around that time, but was interesting. During the peak times, they used to make this box smaller. The reason was because if you added more keywords, uh, you added the complexity to the search and the computation power. Uh, for, for them, for what was uh, what was sufficient? Obviously, the computers were not fast enough and scalable enough, and also the algorithms were not that efficient, probably. And they used to make this when they were to pick times. So they used to make this smaller to discourage people to add many keywords because the more keywords you added, added the complexity of the search and the scalability was, was an issue. Again, that's important. And good, yeah, when we are designing applications, it's good to think of the complexity and the scalability and flexibility of solutions we are designing. And the early search, engine, the search engines of the uh, internet, oh, I had to edit this page, okay. uh, uh, early search engines on internet uh, uh, used to report how many pages they index because there was a competition between like back in Google and Yahoo who indexes more pages. That doesn't, that sounds very ridiculous now, no one mentions it, but of course when you find a solution, then you create a scalable solution, that, that's already you take it for granted. But these are the early days they were saying, oh, we are indexing 25 million pages. Now they say they have more than 30 trillion, trillion pages, yeah, 30 trillion individual unique pages. Now, if you take that analogy, now let's look at some of the applications and then you can link it to say, you, you decide where we are or how you're going to design an application, to what stage you want to take it. Uh, but the, on each of of things, our ultimate goal, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, and today Stefano was talking about it, is to be able to integrate data from different sources and then transform that data to something which can be used by different applications and eventually transform that to some actionable information and also be able to feed it back uh, to some actuators or some other software agents to be able to use that information. But everything gets connected, obviously our communication patterns change. Now, our most of the cellular communication is designed for mobile phones, and the mobile phones like usually have a higher overhead in terms of communication. If you're putting like thousands of sensors now in an area, you're trying to connect them to your mobile networks, that hasn't happened that that the scale map, but eventually it will happen. Then the way the cellular communication, the mobile networks work, will change. That's why you hear a lot about the narrowband IoT, 5G communications, they are trying to integrate IoT sources because you need to make it a communication between now tiny devices in terms of energy efficiency more efficient and in terms of the overhead of the communication more efficient. 
uh, and also the interoperability becomes an issue. As we have seen this morning, and the different devices send their data, there is a different format. Again, that is another uh, becomes issue. And obviously, security, privacy, trust always becomes a crucial part of all the system designs because the system is providing data related to individuals, related to environments, related to mission critical infrastructures, which you want only the right people at the right time to have access to that data. In terms of requirements, uh, mentioned this, obviously we will have a large number of devices. The data uh, uh, rates could be low data rate, I said if you have video or uh, audio, you, that data rate actually could be high. But in terms of the scale, we have a larger number of devices. Energy efficiency is, is a key issue. In terms of the mobility, some of these resources, they are not now web servers in a fixed place, they are resources which move uh, from one location to another location. If you are registering them in an IoT registry and you want to search for their availability, you want to search for data, sometimes actually you might move from one place to another place. Obviously, mobile communication, this handover between mobile base stations has uh, been addressing this for, for a long time. But like if I have a mobile number as a UK mobile number, I come to Italy, see if someone calls me, my call gets redirected to my phone here, and basically the mobile operators, mobile basis stations start handing over and re changing the registry information to find where I am. Now we need to think of how this can be solved in, in terms of uh, uh, IoT applications and IoT uh, scenarios. And obviously different applications will have their own different requirements uh, and characteristics. Some of the typical applications in our IoT are uh, looking at event detection. We have uh, infrastructure, we deploy sensors, and we are looking for the events, for the changes in the uh, in environment. Yesterday, we briefly uh, mentioned some of the change detection algorithms, pattern detection algorithms, which can be applied here to find anomalies, to find unusual patterns. Sometimes we are uh, monitoring a, a phenomenon or we're monitoring environment for periodic information. In that case, it's the you may need to create a dashboard to be able to give a visual information which will produce about the data and allow people to see the graphs, see the historic data. You have seen uh, several examples during the past two, uh, three days. Uh, Paolo showed uh, some really interesting work, how they get the data, create several interfaces. This, this morning, Marshall showed some examples of how you can actually take data measurement and create the visual interfaces for uh, providing access to that data. Sometimes we need to find approximate, uh, like if, if you are finding an event, we also want to find a boundary of that event, want to approximate it. For example, if you're monitoring, let's say, fire uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a forest area, if you have deployed sensors and you want to automatically be able to detect, it's not just detecting it, you want to combine the wind information, the direction of the, how the sensors detect heat and smoke, and you want to identify which direction it's moving, for example, approximate the boundary of that event. If you're detecting traffic, it's not just you're detecting the traffic, you're interested to see how that traffic has affected other adjunct areas. Then you might use the sensory information in collaboration with different resources to be able to find that. And obviously tracking the objects is a typical application in IoT. And often is, is the important thing is a loop. We do a sensing and then we collect and analyze the information and then we send the information to an actuator. An actuator makes a change in the environment and we have, we have again a controller which we look at to see whether we have to, uh, the change we have applied, what has been the impact, and again, we sense the gain. Then if you are, for example, controlling the temperature here, you have a sensor which tells you this is too cold, too warm, you switch on or switch off the air conditioner, and then again, you check again what has been the impact of your action and start again going through that same loop. Then often it's a loop of sensing, actuation, and a control. Type of services we provide, often that if we are providing services for our applications, we need to look at uh, uh, basically autonomy of those, ma making it most of the time the idea is machine to machine communication, and in some cases maybe machine to machine communication and then providing some data to users. Providing the services, right services and interfaces for the machines. For example, if you are searching for the data for uh, a, 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 a registering information, we are designing it for other machines to come and use it, and not necessarily uh, human users. Or in some cases, we might create interfaces for both. And obviously, for different applications, we need to think of what type of the quality requirements we have in terms of the delay, in terms of the reliability of the service, in terms of the accuracy. Uh, of the data or accuracy of the information we are providing. When we design, also we need to think of fault tolerance. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when I took uh, in, in a few minutes about our healthcare application, I'll mention that like, one, of, one of the key uh, uh, design considerations we had was how reliable our system was, uh, is. Uh, uh, the first few months we deployed our sensor, once we had a power cap. 
caught. And our UPS lost for like an hour and our servers went down. But if you have like a healthcare application, if you have patients behind a system, that's not something you're going to tolerate. Then in designing applications, we have to look at again, the really look at our design and think how we're going to provide a file to our own system. So I mentioned what the steps we took to address that. Lifetime of your network. If you're monitoring something that you put your sensors in, in an environment which accessing them, maintaining them is difficult, then you need to think of the lifetime of the network. So a good example is putting sensors in, in marine areas, monitoring sensors that are under, life, uh, under the sea, life or temperature or pollution. And if the sensors are somewhere difficult to get, then the lifetime network energy efficiency becomes important. The density of deployment, depending on the applications you have, you might decide whether how many sensors you know you want, where the sensors should be deployed, in, in what uh, proximity they should be to each other, and whether they need to be programmable or you pre-program them, you deploy them. Do you need to access them remotely to update the programs? Because once you have written a program, you find a bug, and you now you have deployed them thousands of them around the city. You're gonna not you are not gonna gonna climb up all the poles and change the sensors. You might think of if I am deploying a sensor somewhere which is difficult to access, what are my mechanisms to be able to access them and uh, deploy them again? And uh, the maintenance uh, uh, considerations. If you're again deploying for a real world application, maintainability of those resources are important. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, smart cities, uh, let's look at some of the first smart city applications. A few years ago, well, you know, several years ago, when we started uh, working on smart cities, I was curious to see how people thought of smart cities like maybe a generation before us. And what, what was the perception of smart cities when people were thinking about it before the IoT technologies came? Then I did a search and I found this article from LA Times. This was in 1998, not a very long time ago. And this is like uh, how in 1998 LA Times uh, portrayed Los Angeles in 2013. Those are the electric cars going in the street. These are like 400 story buildings in the city. And the story like reads like a robot makes your lunch and so on. And I went and looked at, this was around actually 2013 when I was looking for this. And I went and I looked at some pictures from Los Angeles in 2013. That's how it looked like. Uh, and in average, I think that uh, citizens in, in Los Angeles spend four hours of their life in, 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 in traffic jams. But that is a reminder, actually, most of the problems we are trying to solve haven't changed. It doesn't mean when we are creating something smart, we need to make our cities to look like, I don't know, a spaceship, but we, we look at some very sophisticated technologies. Actually, the problems are some of the primitive problems which we have had them for decades. What has changed is our ability to be able to access better data, more real-time data, and create ma ma uh, machine uh, processes, solutions which can convert that data to some sort of actionable knowledge which can allow us to be make better decisions to predict some of these events. This is a picture around, again, 2013 from Guildford, that's where my university is. And uh, this area, this is the town center. And you, the, the tip of the car will tell you the level of water. But like uh, uh, flooding in, in, in sometimes is, is a big problem. If you look at that, that flooding has, the part of it is maybe we have caused it to make it worse. What has been around? What has changed now? We can put sensors, we can collect information, we can measure the rain level, we can go and look at historical data, we can combine the historical data with the, uh, air, uh, with the, the weather forecast data, we can uh, put sensors, monitor the uh, water level in the rivers, and maybe by combining this information, we can extract some information of telling us the risk of, for example, an area being flooded. And also we have mechanisms now to communicate that information better to people who actually can work to prevent it, to control it and people who might be affected. And then if you're thinking of using IoT applications, maybe it's good to think of actually what are the problems, not to think of let's create a new problem to solve. There are lots of problems which these technologies can already help us to, to solve them. In smart city scenarios, you can think of uh, lots of diff different applications, uh, uh, like traffic management, waste management, and, and so on. What has changed for the cities? I mean, cities have been collecting, more or less if you uh, look at most of the cities have been collecting information regarding the, their infrastructure, regarding the traffic, regarding their waste management in one way or the other. Uh, often in the past, this data has been collected to generate some reports, maybe some PDF reports, some printed reports, monthly, quarterly reports. 
And usually that's a slow process. You collect your data, it's analyzed often manually with some manual effort, and then you do some off, uh, offline data analytics. What IoT is, is allows us to do now, we can collect similar data, but we can collect them in near real time. We can do near real time decision making. Instead of collecting to see how efficient is our waste collection around the city, actually we can put sensors to see where are the areas now the waste needs to be collected today and maybe we prioritize an area compared to other areas. And that's the notion of, of using sensors to make intelligent decisions based on some near real time and uh, uh, contextual information we get from our uh, physical environment. Obviously, uh, we've talked about, we can look at the traffic data, you have seen several examples of it. When we're designing applications for smart cities, uh, as I mentioned, it's good to think of uh, for larger scale applications. When you think of if what we're creating, how can it scale up? What APIs we are providing? If, if, if you're providing an infrastructure which other developers are going to use, how are we going to expose our uh, basic functionalities of our system to other developers? or what type of interaction we will have with other uh, third-party uh, applications. And it's also always important to think of who will use that system, who are the end beneficiaries of that system, and often getting them involved, getting them uh, to help you in the designing of the system is, is a very, very good decision because it helps your system to be adapted and to be used uh, in a much better sense. And also we need to think of if you are designing a data format, some models, the world keeps changing, how our system will evolve over time. It's not by the time we finish our system, the technology has changed and our system cannot adapt to new changes. We need to think when we're designing how the next generation of that system also will, be, uh, uh, will work and will be applicable. Uh, these are like some examples uh, of where you see the cities for, uh, when they publish information, for example, uh, uh, Paolo mentioned this, uh, in, in lots of cities you will see that they have an open data platform and often the data uh, is published, made available to citizens, but sometimes you see that data is in like PDF format. Uh, it's good to have that data, but when you publish your data or the data becomes available in PDF format, that makes it difficult for people to analyze or uh, for, for that basically computer systems to be able to analyze and process that data. Then publishing the information is good, but publishing them in, in a way which you can take that data and analyze it is, is again is an important issue. Then publishing in publishing data again, creating data sets which can be uh, say have some uh, semantic annotations, some models, and also for providing tools to be, able to be able to validate, evaluate that data is important. Using common vocabularies to make it take that data be uh, it's easier to be integrated with other uh, data sources becomes important. And again, the principle of designing uh, models, it's always better to try to reuse or link the data you're providing to other common existing models. And some of the best models are adapted on the internet are the simple ones. We, we talked about this. And it's important to think of the simplicity. Simplicity not just making it too simple not too effective, but simplicity in terms of the beneficiaries. If you're designing a system which developers, they need to take that data and integrate it to their system, it's better to provide good documentation, provide uh, APIs, provide tools which allows them to take that data and integrate it to their system. And often also, again, the, 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 what we're designing in IoT might need uh, to be used by different people. And it's good to think of who are these groups are going to use this and what type of needs and what type of uh, expertise they require to use this data and try to think and design your system uh, uh, based on that. And obviously, when we are collecting data, especially for real time, uh, for uh, the real applications, it's good to think of the privacy security issues and think what happens if something goes wrong. Because often when we design the system, we think of the best case scenarios, we think I'll put sensors, I monitor people's health, and I'll uh, help them to live better. This is really good, but we need also to think, if we create a healthcare system which is going to now depend on this IoT system, what things could go wrong? Well, what steps we are going to take to prevent them? If you're taking uh, some sensors to monitor, for example, a, a, a critical infrastructure, it's good because you're helping that system to be monitored more effectively, more efficiently, more continuously. But also you need to think of what are the mechanisms if your sensors suddenly didn't work? Because now if people rely on your technology for that, I don't know, that power plant to be monitored, uh, what are the steps you have taken to make sure if suddenly your sensor infrastructure failed, 
for the sensor to start malfunctioning, what, what procedures will at least inform you that system doesn't work correctly? Or when you collect data, what steps you are taking to validate that's the correct data? Uh, uh, differentiating between noise, between a malfunctioning device and real data. And also, again, uh, but let me think of designing applications for cities. Uh, always you see applications like, like nice pictures showing like, like glossy pictures, changing the world, we are making everything more efficient. I'll do that all the time myself. Also, we need it's good to think of actually making them more available to, to really, uh, to, to everyone. Uh, and also think of the cost and uh, cost of maintenance and cost of development of them if you want to really make a, a positive impact and make something which can become scalable. An example uh, I came across a few years ago was from the city of Detroit. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know the story of Detroit. A few years ago, the, the, the city, it, it's a city in the US, in Ohio, uh, went bankrupt. And uh, the bankruptcy, the, um, I typically had an article about the uh, state of the IT system in, in Detroit. And they were talking about the, like some of the infrastructure, some of the IT systems they had were very old. Like some of the fire departments still were using fax machines, like to dispatch information. Uh, and uh, they were talking about uh, uh, upgrading the IT system. And they went to their uh, bankruptcy judge, and uh, the judge agreed to release 100 million of their assets to be able to go and buy a new IT system to upgrade their IT system. Uh, around the time I, 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 I had written the article, they had estimated to, to buy a new IT system, an IT infrastructure for their uh, city, uh, it would have cost them around uh, 16 million dollars uh, for in terms of the human resource out of that 100 110 million and an IT system of a class B would have cost them something around 86 million dollars still they couldn't go they wanted to upgrade but still they couldn't go and upgrade it to the most like state of the art systems they had to still opt out to a class B system because it was very expensive now, if you are thinking of adding sensors, making our cities smarter, interesting, better places to live, uh, this is really, really good, but we need to think of the cost of those infrastructures, the environmental aspect of all these electronic gadgets now we are deploying in our environment, and design something which is cost efficient and will allow us to, and also to be sustainable and will allow us to use them for a long, uh, 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 at least a reasonable uh, uh, period of time. And also making the systems available to everyone is important. This is uh, where I live. I live in West London, and uh, uh, in, the, in, in London transport, London has a very good public transport, is because it's public. And uh, is we have this screens. I, I guess you have it here. It shows what time the bus arrives. In around the area I live, actually, some of these bus stops they don't have that screen. Uh, but I, then we moved there. I said it's okay. I have a mobile app and. For now, let's assume, I know you can talk about the digital literacy, access of people to mobile phones, but for now, let's assume that, okay, everyone has an access to a smartphone and they can take their smartphone and they uh, look at it. This was a generation before Google Maps tells you the bus information. I don't know, in London now, Google it has integrated the state and Google Maps will tell you. I had this app and one day I opened the app, uh, it used to tell me what time the bus is going to arrive, and one day I opened my app and told me the first one is free, for the rest, you have to pay. And that was a reminder for me, when you add this complex technology, you have to think of not to create another digital divide. Now, if someone pays, parks better, lives better, has better information, and what happens to people who are not affording this? Because in the past, this was free. This was a smart screen, everyone could see it, everyone could access it. We made it nicer, but we also made it some sort of a premium service now. At uh, designing IoT applications, I think it's good to think of designing solutions, maybe in, in, in many cases, if you're designing something for public use, to think of the cost and availability of it. It's not just the cost, it's also creating a system which everyone can use it. Elderly people, people who don't have, actually don't use the smartphones, smart technology on a daily basis, you create a system which helps them and allows them to use information in an easy and intuitive way. Again, these are very good steps to take uh, in real world to make your applications more adaptable and more access accessible to a wider uh, group of uh, people. Uh, some examples, uh, we had a project a few years ago, it uh, was called City Pulse. Uh, this was a, a, a 
uh, like uh, this is a model of city of Aarhus. This is the uh, uh, second biggest city in Denmark. And my colleagues created a, a 3D model of city of Aarhus and then wrote an application, uh, started uh, collecting the raw data which they were providing from city infrastructure, air quality, traffic information. And they wrote an application on top of it which was looking at uh, events were happening. Basically, an event generation system looked at all this data, analyzed the data, and generated an event. Uh, this, if you see the slides, the different color intensities shows the uh, intensity of traffic. The more red they get, it shows well, more traffic. And then we created an app on top of that which allowed to generate events related to air quality. For example, if someone has asthma, uh, wants to go part of town, you look at the air quality, you look at the traffic, and you recommend them whether they should go or they should avoid an area. And uh, one of our colleagues in Siemens, uh, he took this and created a mobile app, which was just like a sort of a sat nav navigator, but while you were going from A to B, you could subscribe to some events related to that area, traffic related events, parking related like information or air quality events. As you travel, you start getting the alerts. Uh, my colleagues at the University of Os University of Applied Science uh, in Osnabrück, they took the same data, they created uh, uh, an application which looked at the quality of data we were collecting. We were collecting. And for quality, they were taking the timestamps when the data was measured, because every sensor when measured the data had a timestamp, and when the data was related to the backend server in the city of August, which we could access that data, had another timestamp. And they were measuring the delay of accessing information. They were looking at the availability of data. They were looking at the uh, at sensors which they were sending data and how often actually that sensor, how reliable that sensor is, because some sensors at some point they were either running out of battery or for some reasons they were not sending their information. They, they had a, a, a series of matrix and they collected all this matrix and they added them up, they gave a score and based on that score they were saying how reliable your resources are. Each of these you can imagine are a, a set of sensors, a sensor, uh, sensor information coming from different parts of the city of Aarhus. And the green they were, when they were green, they were saying the air quality of data is, is high. The red there they were becoming, it was telling us the quality of data is, is going down. Then we started creating this application. We noticed in the morning when we were looking at the sensors, most of the sensors were green. And by the midday, by mid, uh, late, late morning, by midday, everything was turning red. It's telling the quality of information is going down. And we started thinking, we went and talked to our colleagues in the city of Aarhus, and we asked them what they think, what could be the cause of it. It turns out, when they, uh, they had basically uh, uh, given it to a company to go and deploy the, the, the sensors, and they were deploying the sensors on the lampposts. And sensors were getting their power, sensor nodes were getting their power from the lampposts. And in, in, in Aarhus, when they, obviously when it was live, the lampposts were they basically get all disconnected. They don't have any power means that sensors, they didn't have power to charge. But if you're designing it in Scandinavia, you need to think of, in summer, they didn't have much night, like they would have had like an hour. That means the sensors didn't have enough time to recharge because the lampposts were not on enough. And that was the reason. In the morning, we could see the sensors were giving us the information, and by midday, everything was just basically, all the sensors were running out of battery and they were dying. This was part of the infrastructure. And again, that, Creating that interface gave us a very good view of our data. Sometimes it, you design something for a purpose and then you learn something from it. And also design, it gave us, gave the city designers a good information to go and obviously easy to fix these things, uh, to, to think of how they should redesign their infrastructure, right? Uh, and, and again, these are the applications when you start also visualizing data, you will give, give you information to, about your system, about your infrastructure. And obviously that led us to think of actually we can design some applications to collect this data, not necessarily for processing or automating anything, actually giving data to city designers, to people who actually set policies for the city, to have a better information when they make decisions. Uh, similarly, you can collect like base day data, air quality data, and if people are now want to design, build a new library, I don't know, a new exhibition center in the city, you give them good information about different issues around that area to make us better decisions. The second use case scenario is uh, a project we started a, a few years ago called uh, uh, TIM for Dementia. TIHM stands for Technology Integrated Healthcare Management, but over time we're just using it uh, as a brand for TIM for dementia. 
Uh, this is a project funded by the National Health Service and Department of Health in the UK. It started around three years ago and focuses on uh, dementia. Uh, familiar Alzheimer's is a subcategory of dementia. It affects people's cognitive uh, uh, capability uh, and uh, over time uh, they basically can progress. In the UK, at the moment, there are something where 850,000 people are registered with dementia. Uh, we spend formally or informal, in terms of formal and informal care, around 23 billion pounds per year for dementia care. And at any given time in the UK, one in four hospital beds are taken by someone uh, with dementia. But that probably gives you some idea about the scale of the problem. Uh, by 2025, it is estimated in the UK that there will be around uh, 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 20, uh, over 1 million people uh, with dementia, and the cost will increase uh, probably. Uh, but this is an interesting observation. The Alzheimer's Society in the UK, they did a study and uh, they, they noticed 20% of these hospital admissions in people with dementia are due to preventable causes. And if there was a way we could uh, detect these conditions early, we could manage these conditions earlier, we could uh, prevent those hospital admissions. And obviously this is beneficial for patients, for the carers, and also for healthcare system. And you can see when one in four hospital beds are occupied by someone with that condition. We started a, a, this project and the idea was looking at the Internet of Things technologies and uh, we're working with different industries to see if we can use Internet of Things and data analytics to detect some of the early conditions and also to help and support people with dementia and their carers. We worked with seven companies which provided different technologies and different devices. Most of these devices are uh, sensory devices which can monitor environmental data like light, uh, temperature, noise, carbon monoxide, or devices which can monitor uh, people's body vital signals. And in the initial version, we didn't have, uh, we had built one device, but let's say we didn't use variables uh, for monitoring people's body, uh, vital signals. We were relying on devices which you could just take, like, like this one, uh, that people can just puts their on their finger press and reads their heart rate, reads their blood oxygen, or we had weight scales, we asked a lot of our participants to stand on the weight scale, we read people's weight and also their hydration level. Uh, we have sensors for monitoring blood pressure, body temperature, and so on. This was designed uh, with the help of some of our uh, user groups. We asked some of our, uh, our participants, people with dementia and their carers, to come. We created a living lab to come and we basically went to IKEA. We bought it like an IKEA flat. We started putting the technology and we invited some of our uh, trusted users to come and help us in co-designing this, tell us how they, uh, they feel about this technology, how they think, how acceptable these different technologies we use for them, and we learned some uh, basic ideas of, of our design. And uh, also, we, uh, this project is led by a clinical group from our National uh, Health Service, from the NHS, and they looked at the clinical aspect of it. They told us what are the requirements, what conditions we should monitor, and always I put it this way, I said, what we do is interesting, it's not important. What is important are conditions that these people we need to help, and what our doctors want, and what the carers they think we should provide. What we do, I like to think is important, and I like to see it is. I, I like it very much, but it's interesting. But important thing is delivering the final uh, product uh, uh, to uh, to our people who benefit from that. The project ran. Uh, we have finished the first phase, and it was a randomized control trial. Uh, if you're familiar with clinical trials. Uh, you have two groups. One group, they get the technology, and one group doesn't get the technology. Then you have a baseline for comparison. And each group, we had around 100 homes. Since each home will have had one person with dementia and a carer, and another 100 group which didn't receive the technology. Altogether, around 400 people participated in this in the first one. And now we are uh, in the stage of starting actually phase two, probably early next month. How the technology works, we uh, deploy the sensors in our participants' homes. And most of the sensors, they are uh, uh, basically all of them, they are connectable devices. They connect uh, mainly via uh, low energy Bluetooth. They send their data to a gateway. And that gateway relays that information back to a backend server. And then we, in the backend server, we collect all this information, we integrate them, we analyze that, and we create an interface for our clinician. 
And then our clinician, we have a clinical monitoring group. Once we have taken the data, once we have analyzed it, we create some notifications, some alerts, and the clinical monitoring team now looks at these alerts and make a decision or calls, for example, uh, the carrier, calls people, uh, people's home, or they might call some of the healthcare services to get help and support. Again, in this system, you have sort of automation of automating of collecting data, automating of processing data, but the end result, automating of how you show the data, how you present the data, how you generate the alert, but we have kept human in the loop. Still, the end decision-making process and interaction with our participants is done by uh, our expert clinicians who uh, the basically contact our patients or talk to them. Uh, in principle, we deploy the sensors in homes, the sensors send information, and then within our uh, uh, lab, we have created the infrastructure to store this data, analyze this data. And in one of the hospitals, we have like something like a call center. Then you will have a few people sitting there, they have the screen uh, of the software we have developed, and they will look at that uh, alerts we are generating, and then we call or decide uh, to contact and speak to patients or take an action. The first issue we had, now you can link up to some of the concepts we have been talking about the past few days, was interoperability. We started working with seven companies. Uh, these companies, they had devices. In some cases, they had overlapping devices. For example, the blood pressure monitoring we were getting from three companies at the same device. But in different brands, different format, different data they were sending, body temperature monitoring, we had different companies. And we wanted to give the choice to our participants. We, we, we created three packs, which was a combination of different devices provided. Everyone got the same sensors, same markers, the same number of sensors we were putting, but people would have got different brands, different devices. And we wanted to create a system which is not dependent on one particular device. We wanted to to integrate, uh, let's say, people's blood pressure, not being dependent on what device you're using to monitor the blood pressure. And obviously, interoperability between the different devices, different data sources was an issue. We agreed to, uh, uh, to create a set of common APIs. In the project, we have a common API, we use the RabbitMQ, uh, and all the data providers, all our industry providers, they program their uh, uh, basic interfaces to send data according to the common interface we have uh, designed, and this was a co-design uh, of working with our collaborators. And for the data, we went and looked at the standards for uh, expressing and representing uh, healthcare data. In the UK and I think uh, in other parts of the world, is there is a standard called HL7, which is used for storing basically the clinical data in databases. This is just the format for data. The new version of it is called FHIR, F-H-I-R. We created a subset of FHIR and for some of the terms we were detecting, if say someone has, uh, let's say, hypertension, someone has an infection, we needed some common vocabularies also to express the semantics later on when we were analyzing to get data. For that, we used the vocabulary called SNOMED. Uh, again, these are common standards to design in, in the health community, has been used for, uh, for several years. And, uh, Obviously, they, when they design, no one thought of designing them for an IoT application, but if you're monitoring my blood pressure using a sensor, that's the same data which when I go to see my GP collects my blood pressure. And when my GP enters my blood pressure, it says X, and it stores in their healthcare system, it's the same, which in terms of the format for the system, it's the same which I use a sensor in someone's home. We used uh, adapted parts of that, and we created an interoperable model uh, it's represented in JSON and then as some semantic labels. Basically, this is a common language. And once you have the common language, then we share it with all our partners. And then if everyone sends the information using the common language, our higher level system is designed based on that common language. We didn't need to worry too much about what device we are taking and who sends the information. Uh, we published that online. It's just a, a available uh, to public, and everyone can take and use that information. We didn't create a vocabulary; it was already there. We just integrated and adapted some part of it, and also we represented it in JSON. Also, we created some libraries. Uh, I think we created a Python library with CSV format. We provided some examples. That was for our collaborators, and at the same time for other people who might have. Uh, Try in the future, we wanted to integrate the data. And we tried it with a few other new devices. Once you have the examples, then you have the common uh, uh, notion of it. It's easy to integrate new sets of devices in the system because as, as soon as you just ask someone to adapt that data format, publish the data, your system, the other higher level uh, parts of the system automatically will be able to pick that data and integrate it into the system. 
For the back end, for now let's just skip the in data analytics part, I'll go back in a minute to that, but once we had collected the data, we could integrate it from different sources. For the clinical end, we created a, a system, we call it Integrated View. This is a web-based application. Each home, or you can imagine each uh, patient, will appear like uh, a car. And if there are some important events, some alerts happening, that card will open up and will show the alerts. And alerts are designed based on three categories, uh, are technical, environmental, and clinical. And if everything is okay, there is no alert, the system will minimize itself. And it's a dynamic system. It will reorganize itself based on priority of events. For example, if you're monitoring me and I had a fall, and I'm this patient, this system uh, automatically will move it always on the top left corner of the screen. Then what happens is we can monitor a large number of participants with a few people because they can always sit and look at this screen. If there is nothing important happening, no uh, significant alert, the system will minimize itself and then you have a lot of users. In practice, when you go to our clinical uh, team's office, you see this, they have these large screens and lots of uh, these cards appearing on the screen. And then when the alerts are generated, uh, we look at three different things. Because we use technology to monitor, uh, devices to monitor, we want to make sure those devices work and function. Then we have set, a set of rules. There are simple rules. For example, we know uh, the, uh, let's say, movement data, movement sensor uh, knows they should send their data, let's say, every minute. And if for a few minutes we don't receive that data, we generate an alert. Then we have a technical team which will try to look at it, and in some cases they might go and investigate or replace that device. Uh, environmental data will look at like temperature, simple things like people's home temperature. These are very simple signals. And you look at it like that suddenly, for example, temperature goes uh, below 15 degrees Celsius, it's cold, people might get hypothermia and you make a decision whether you should call the patient, you should call the carers. And if you look at, there are some studies to show what are the right temperatures. Like in, uh, there was a study in certain conditions that up in people over 65, uh, like if the temperature goes below, I don't know, 15 or 15 degrees Celsius, their functionality decreases and increases their risk of, of certain conditions. And then we decide, talking to our clinical team and looking at the clinical literature, decide to what, for example, is an acceptable or safe range for each of these. Uh, usually this single processing uh, of each of the streams is not very complex in terms of the analytical models, in terms of the learning models, but they have a, a very good significant use in our, in our system. Clinical algorithms, we look at some uh, health conditions. We uh, monitor our participants based on uh, 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 some infections, uh, some uh, uh, conditions like agitation. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. And we generate alerts related to health. Before that, uh, in any case, we provide the, what I call it, the provenance information. Our clinicians always, they can go and see their own data. It, the idea of the system is designed in a way which generates alerts. Like our uh, basic clinical team will respond to alerts, but having said that, anytime they want to go and see, when we say, for example, someone has an infection, if they want to go and see all the data, they can go and see the raw data. I've just cut the screen in different order. It doesn't look like this. It will look in a screen in different parts of the screen. But they can see all the data. They can click on it. They can see the graph. They can see the historical data. And also you can create means of providing this data for participants to take it to their doctor. For example, some of our participants, when they go to see their doctor, they can take their blood pressure data for the past month. Now the doctor doesn't only take my blood pressure in, in, when I'm in the surgery, can look at my blood pressure data for the past month, and uh, probably that, that's a very much better way of, of using that information and more reliable uh, in some cases. When an alert happens, when you click on one of those cards, a, a screen like this will appear, and uh, then we'll show you obviously here is a bit of randomness because we are using from our living lab to show the graph of each of the uh, primary markers we are collecting. Here uh, uh, we'll explain there is a clinical alert. We generate some textual descriptions to explain what that alert is. And when our clinicians, they click on that alert, uh, they can see uh, a four, which they can now uh, uh, see that how our algorithms has decided, based on what markers, what parameters our algorithm has decided to, uh, to generate that alert. 
Also, they can add some follow-ups. For example, in some cases, when someone has, let's say, risk of infection, if they have contacted the patient, they can add a follow-up for next day. And if somebody else tomorrow is monitoring that person, we we'll receive another alert to go and, and follow it up. They can also say if that was an error. And when we generate an alert using a machine learning algorithm, and sometimes in some cases the algorithm doesn't work well, or there's a sensory data we have analyzed and we thought in some cases it's not, when they say error, that gets recorded and we can retrain our algorithms because that basically labeling our information for false positives and true positives. Uh, we have a, a, an algorithm which will look at people's day-to-day -day activities and we'll try to analyze and see if people suddenly their act, the day-to-day -day activities, the day-to-day -day tasks they do significantly changes. And if we see significantly low activity or significantly high activity, we generate an alert. And that alert could be when people get ill, maybe they are not active enough, maybe they don't get out of the bed, or in some cases, maybe people are anxious, maybe shows uh, some levels of hyperactivity. Again, these are all done by uh, some analytical algorithms which generate the data. Uh, in terms of the analytics and in terms of the machine learning, the very, one of the very first things we did, we looked at some of the vital signals we were collecting, like people's body temperature, blood pressure, and we created algorithms which personalize that towards uh, individuals. For example, I can be uh, on the upper or lower upper boundary of, let's say, the blood pressure. My normal blood pressure is slightly high. And we talked to our doctors and we tried to ask and, and learn what are the absolute minimums and absolute maximums which we can tolerate and if something goes above that or goes below that, we need to generate an alert. Those are becomes these red boundaries in these pictures and for each of the markers. And then we run the algorithms, let's say for a week or two, and we learn what is the people, what, what is an individual's norm, when, where, which part of that spectrum they are. And then from there, we learn the, let's say, mean and standard deviation. And from there, we start looking at the changes. And then the significant changes in people will generate an alert, or if they move to a risk area, we generate an alert. We use that, for example, to detect uh, hypertension when people's blood pressure goes up and down and could increase some uh, risk in their health condition. We can gener uh, uh, generate alerts. And that's individualized, that's personalized to an individual. Algorithms can read data, you can interpret it, you can adapt it to each individual. And computers are good at repetitive things. If you program them correctly, if you give them the right information, they can repetitively do this, you can repetitively analyze this information. And this can be done on a daily basis. If you have continuous of this information, you can do it continuously. Uh, Part of the algorithms, uh, then we are looking at individual markers, individual markers like people's body uh, vital signals, environmental data, and generate uh, personalized alerts. We combine all these markers, we create uh, something we call it a, a, a dementia wellness score on a day to day basis, based on people's activity, based on their body vital signals. We took some, looked at some medical literature in intensive care, they have something like this in hospitals, but they connect and wire people to different devices and collect information and generate the daily wellness, wellness score. We used a similar technology, uh, a similar idea, uh, using our technology devices to create a daily wellness score based on uh, activity data, based on people's vital signals. The interesting use of it is to give us in a snapshot to our clinicians how well the patients are on a daily basis. And if you collect data, you can start looking at the uh, trend of data. We looked at change detection algorithms yesterday. You can look at the change detection algorithms. You can think of predictive algorithms. If you look at the sums, you have a series, this becomes a time series data. If you have a time series data, you can start thinking of can you predict uh, 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 what that data is going to look like in the next two weeks then maybe you can identify using that. We haven't got to that stage, but we're working on it. We better we can identify if someone's health is going to deteriorate in the next two weeks significantly compared to what, what, what the state they are now. Uh, we also have developed a set of uh, uh, more complex algorithms look, looking at uh, some health conditions. One of the very uh, first things we did, looking at ag agitation, uh, well, it should be the other way around. Agitation, aggression, and ir irritation, and aggression. Sorry, this should have been other way around. Starts with agitation and goes. Agi when, uh, 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 
Well, one of the health conditions or, or related to people uh, uh, with dementia is being agitated. And if, again, sometimes that can leave people leaving the house, for example, going and wandering, or sometimes it can uh, uh, lead to being uh, escalate their health conditions. And we were looking for a way, can we detect agitation? There is no sensor to be able to detect agitation. If I had a sensor put in someone's house and it says agitated, would that solve the problem? We looked at uh, different ways of detecting agitation and we came up with an algorithm which uses hidden market models. I'll, I'll have a graph and I'll show you how it works. Uh, we have a few other algorithms which look at the vital signals and tries to detect some uh, complex health conditions, which again is data we use is coming from in-home sensory information. There are environmental and some uh, vital body monitoring, uh, let's say, sensors, and there are a set of algorithms behind that which they uh, analyze it. Uh, a few things I forgot to mention, these technologies are not expensive. We look for the technologies which are really cheap and cost effective. Like, like we are thinking of uh, being able to deploy these devices in homes with a cost around 600 and probably even less. We are thinking between 300 to 600 pounds. The cost of deploying it and also monitoring people for a year. Uh, then it's, it's important to think of we are not the deploying sophisticated technologies which cost thousands. No, it's the idea is using low-cost devices and devices which could be widely available to everyone. And the end target is to uh, reduce the hospital admissions, to allow people to stay in their home environment uh, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, for preventable causes stop them to be admitted to hospital and also delay or uh, delay their admission to care homes. The people can live longer in their own home environment, they can go less to hospital, it's, it's, it's a good thing for them, uh, hopefully with their carers and their families. Uh, how do these uh, uh, technologies work for detecting complex conditions? For example, we have sensors in the living room monitoring people's movements. We look at these movement patterns, we look at, these are like uh, per day, if you x-axis, and these are per hour, uh, x-y-axis. Uh, like sensors for bed occupancy, for example, we had sensors like just pressure mats, and we were putting people to sleep on the bed, you can see, you can read the pressure, and you can see people are on the bed, or when people move in the corridors, when they open the door, we have then uh, sensors which just, just like switches, when you open the door, you just go on and off, a binary switch, or pressure mat is just a binary switch, you go on and off, we have, uh, we have sensors we put under the uh, like cushions on the sofa. If someone sits on it, it just goes on and off, and you can detect if someone's sitting on a sofa or not sitting. And imagine if I sit for long and I don't move, uh, uh, probably if it goes like for five hours, maybe we generate an alert, for example, and say it could be related to some health conditions. And then we combine all this information. Now we are moving from a single marker to a combination of, of different sensors to be able to analyze the information. Let's first look at how we do the pattern analysis. Uh, obviously, I've actually created this. Imagine if each of these boxes are an activity. Let's say red when I'm asleep, uh, green is when I wake up, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go and switch on the kettle or make up a cup of tea. In Italy, will be you make a coffee. Uh, 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 let's say purple on, I'll go, go sit on a sofa, and so on. Uh, if I do everything, these are like, this is in one day, let's say. And if I do the same thing around the same time every single day, the horizontal lines will look the same color, right, for each activity. That's how we visualize it. And we are looking for these patterns, and we are looking how people deviate from these patterns, if there is any pattern in the activity. That's a real data. That's, we took it from a real patient. That's for 14 days. And that's an engineer's way of showing time. It starts from 0 to 1400, basically, minutes in a day. And imagine, oh, if those colors continued, like if you see the green in one vertical line, if you start going horizontally also green, then that activity happened every day around the same time. Obviously, it won't exactly, be, no one will have, a, you, you, I mean, no one will exactly do the same thing exactly at the same time. People will have some le level of randomness in their activities, but you've created an algorithm which learns how much randomness is in that and uses that randomness to detect uh, 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 significant uh, changes. Uh, let me go back, I think. Uh, first, I'll talk about this and I'll go back to the other algorithm. 
To do this, we uh, created a, 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 a Markov chain model. How it, it works, let's say, if you are de detecting a sensor which says cat kettle is on, we call it state A, right? In fact, actually, we even didn't try to put the human readable label. For us, it's an activity. It doesn't matter for a machine, for this algorithm, for the purpose of this algorithm. It doesn't matter what that activity is. And then once that we have a sensor when kettle is on, it looks at the energy for drink and will send a signal to us. We receive a data and say kettle is on. You can add it to TV. You say TV is on. And then we learn what are the activities happening in someone's day-to-day -day life. Let's say if you had four activities. If I switch on the kettle, what will happen if I go and sit on a sofa? What is the probability? How many times? We monitor people for two months. What is the probability? How many times I switch on the kettle, the kettle and went and sat on the sofa? Let's say 60% of the time I did that. What is the probability I go and sit on a chair in the kitchen? Let's say I did it 30% of the time. What is the probability I go back to bedroom? Let's say 10%. And let's say here is outdoor. What is the probability suddenly I leave the house? Over the past two months, I never saw that, right? You can program your machines to learn this Markov chain and look at the transition in between different activities. And then you can see how you go from one activity to other. Just didn't show everything to make. We leave the algorithm to learn this for two months. And then you learn all your probabilities, all your transitional probabilities. And after doing that, we leave the algorithm for another two weeks to see how much we deviate from that activity, how much the changes are. And then we measure the entropy. Are, are you familiar with entropy? If I forgot, is sigma of px log entropy is sigma of px logarithm of px in principle entropy is a measure of surprise if uh, let's say if 80% of the time, I go and sit on the sofa, and if the next day I did the same, you would be less surprised. But if it was very unusual for me to go and sit on a chair, if you see for 10% of the time, then you would be a little surprised. And if I leave the house, you would be entirely surprised, because I never did that before. That was completely unpracticed. And that's what we are looking for. We are looking for how much our... Uh, uh, change surprise our system because we have learned the model we have learned all the transitional probabilities and for a day we start following the people's activity then during the day once the system is is in practice once has passed the training uh, stage what when is in practice we start following people all through the day through these states and every time they go to a new state we, we measure how much we got surprised how much the system got surprised and we add this up then we have an accumulated entropy in the system then the question was, how much entropy will tell you something is not right? What should be the level? How you set your threshold? Because you collect entropy, you will have an entropy. We will have a, a measure. And usually we try to, obviously if you put zero, logarithm of zero will give you infinity. Then usually you avoid zero and you will give a small epsilon. Right. To avoid that. Or you can, depending on how much you want to un completely unclassic things to bias your result, you can make this bigger or smaller. Usually you don't put zero. Let me write it in a different color because it's obvious. Oh. Uh, now, to identify what should be the threshold in our system, what we did, once we deployed the system and learned for two months, uh, we left it for two weeks and learned, the, uh, let's say, the usual entropy in the system. Once we learned the usual entropy, that became our threshold. And if suddenly people significantly deviated from that entropy, we generate an alert. Now you can associate this if people become suddenly very less active, 
uh, that can be related to social isolation or maybe they are not feeling well or if they become hyperactive then it could be related to are agitated, they are nervous or there are some other underlying health conditions. Uh, this is one of the algorithms which in this picture when you look at it is probably I've taken not a very good example of it but here we generate activities and we say there are some small arrows showing up and down, showing increased level of activity, decreased level of activity, what comes from that algorithm. And we use it also in some of our other algorithms this to, uh, as one of our markers. Can you think of a problem in this algorithm? So far so good, when we deployed it, uh, I was very excited, it seemed like we created something really interesting and it worked. Uh, we have published this. In practice, we had a few cases which was a, a really interesting observation for us and we had to go and think and redesign it. Obviously, we have tried to address some of them. In some cases, people's pattern of activity over the weekend and over the weekdays will change. Over the weekends, people will have family coming, they will have their grandkids visiting them. Uh, in some cases, for example, our algorithm had detected some uh, uh, unusual cases and actually someone had uh, like an engineer to, fork, uh, to fix their boiler and our system obviously for good reasons had detected some unusual patterns of activity but wasn't related to exactly to someone's health conditions. Uh, in those cases we start looking at the distribution of our data and we decide whether that's a usual distribution or an unusual distribution and separate them. Then you can actually create maybe two models for weekdays or weekends or maybe you just decide if your sensors are firing from multiple points which seems to be there are multiple people in the house maybe you decide to not to integrate that data in, into your model. You can use some measures. Obviously, not, you, not at least in our case, I don't think it can be all any it is hundred percent accurate. But the more you think of these scenarios and try to separate them or isolate these cases, you become more accurate. Uh, we had a few cases people had pets in their house. That's even a bigger problem because if you have a cat running around, your sensors continuously get confused, and I don't know whether they will have a pattern like an activity or how you integrate that. Uh, in those cases, we thought of uh, actually changing maybe some of our design. If you put sensors in a little higher area, maybe you prevent some of those information to be uh, 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 basically biased towards the other activities. And people will live with their uh, partner, but will live with their carers, they will have visitors, and you never get to the 100% accuracy, but the more you think of those scenarios and try to prevent and isolate them, uh, the more successful these algorithms will work. We now use this in practice in our system and we have a clinical team that looks at this data. In a different uh, 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 algorithm, we are using hidden Markov models to detect agitation. Sorry. You mentioned that you want to find out the different programs operating in the office in other places. Brilliant question. Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, once we deploy this algorithm, we were generating uh, uh, alerts and when we, people are going on holiday, uh, uh, there was no activity and our system was generating alerts to say, I see significantly low activity and we were, our clinical team a few times tried to call people and we couldn't access them, that even is more worrying. And, and then we actually noticed we, 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 how we solved it, we added now, we have added a feature to our system. If people go on holiday, they call our clinical team and they say, I will be on holiday. And then we block those days and the system doesn't generate an alert. What about the office and office during the day? Uh, okay, uh, when they monitor people with dementia, they usually they stay at home. Uh, usually they are elderly people and the, uh, the cognitive condition is, is in, in, in a way which usually they, they will be at home. Well, obviously they will be living at the house, they will be going out, they will go shopping, they will go see their friends. But that becomes part of your patterns. If they have a pattern of doing that, you will learn that pattern as well. Because there will be times of the day you will have a state of uh, nobody's in the home, let's say. You will have a state X, which means nobody is home. And if there is a pattern in it, you will detect. And again, let's say sensitivity of our algorithm is not just any change. We are also learning how much change can be tolerated to say it's not. And we, if monitor for two weeks for people and so that creates an entropy of level of X in our system, we have also learned that. But if suddenly people stop going and seeing their friends, so then we stop going living in the house, now that will become unusual. Or if maybe you have too many people coming in, we will be detected as an unusual factor. The thing is about security to identify person using this, uh, this uh, I think, uh, crash 
sure or uh, in, I mean the problem would be that uh, I can sit here and I, I, have, uh, I have a passion but uh, my wife can also sit here so you, you have to be sure that the, the data is updated the uh, right person. Like again, Marco has a, a perfect uh, a, a question, and this is one of the challenges we have. Because if people will live with somebody, how do you detect which one are actually you're monitoring a, a patient or you're monitoring their carers? In terms of activity, uh, for us it was important to monitor the level of activity because for that particular algorithm, it's still the combination with the works. But when you move to something like agitation, to something like uh, a UTI, that becomes important. Let's say level of activity we learned, there wasn't any way, or we didn't want to tag people also. One thing I, from the beginning I was against it, and I said we never do that, I didn't want people to wear something which is uncomfortable. And I, we didn't want to, when I say I, we, uh, not my meal only, uh, uh, and we didn't want people to wear something uncomfortable. We didn't want to wear people wear, some, wear something which we, if I, I won't wear. Like if I don't want to be identified, I didn't want anybody else to be identified. And we follow that principle. Then practically we don't add something to identify. Then we looked at some other ways in a passive way, whether we can separate between a, a, a carer or a patient or someone uh, stands on it. For activity detection, we looked at the combination of activities. Even for us, it was important if a carer doesn't feel well. Because sometimes it's not you're not just monitoring the health and well-being of a patient, your health and well-being of the carer is also important. That part is important. For activity detection, it makes sense. But when we move to agitation, now we were interested in sort of finding something which was more individualized. It can be personalized towards the patient. For this, uh, we use uh, hidden Markov models. If you're familiar, uh, you will have some hidden states. Let's say my states are agitated, not agitated, which are hidden. I cannot access them. I cannot see them. And let's say if you're modeling at the system, your system will, trans will have a transition between agitated, not agitated. And then you will have some uh, states which you can observe. Like these are the sequences you can observe. We looked at what could be, uh, we asked this question from our clinical team. We said, if you, we gave you a, like a panoramic view of someone's house, you were looking from top, what do you say if someone is agitated? Well, the, our, our doctor said, well, it depends. He said, well, give us some examples. If you see me, how do you say I'm agitated? He said, well, your pattern of uh, movement could change. We have a sensor which monitors of people's movement, right? I can monitor people's how they move around the house. They say, oh, you might go and open the fridge door. I, when I get nervous, I do that. I go and open the fridge every five minutes. I don't take anything. Go back and I go open it again. We put a sensor on the fridge door. Like we could uh, uh, look at how many times people open the fridge door. Uh, people might sit on a sofa and might stand up. They might sit and uh, we look at the chair and sofa and look at it. Uh, people's uh, sleeping patterns might change. Sleeping patterns and so on. And then we look at basically how they are related and the sequences, right? If you're familiar with the Markov model, you look at probability of when I have been agitated, how many of these things you have seen before. You don't know whether I'm agitated or not, but you have some label data and you can go and look back and say, when I was agitated, 20% of the time I have, I was moving erat erratically, uh, I went and opened the fridge door, I did X for each probability. And next time when you see the sequences and you see this, you can uh, infer whether this is related to your state A, agitation or not agitation. Now, I still haven't answered Marco's question, how this becomes personalized, because this is still can be a uh, lot like a carrier. In some cases, then we relied on two Markov models. Uh, one was patient-focused, and one was uh, multi-occupancy hidden Markov model. Initial, our initial hidden Markov model actually integrated everything, and exactly we got to the same point, which we couldn't detect it correctly. Uh, or in some cases, we had false positives. To improve our algorithm, we looked at uh, some of the indicators which we could say with some certainty is related to uh, our, our person with dementia, and then we looked at the, some of the cases which were more public, and then we tried to combine this two information. For example, in our design, 
uh, when we were deploying the sensors, we had a deployment company and a deployment team. They looked at, uh, a, then we put the pressure sensor. We had only one pressure sensor put it on the sofa. We usually asked, where is the common place your uh, person with dementia sits? And we usually try to put the pressure sensor there. And we are assuming most of the time, people will have their own, uh, I have my own special corner in the house, we'll go and sit there. And we try to put the sensor there. That would give us a little high uh, certainty that the person sitting there probably is the person with dementia, but you won't get 100%, you might have a visitor. We looked at like bed occupancy, and if you have like a, a, a bed, you put the sensor on the side, which you think you, you ask, and, and the person with dementia sleeps, and you get more personalized information. We looked at like put sensor on the pillbox and looked at how much they're moving it or how much they uh, use that and we use that information. And then we used, created another uh, uh, hidden Markov model which looked at some of the common data we were collecting, which as Marco mentioned can then get mixed up between different people around the house. And then we used the information coming from these two Markov models and combined it with some uh, clinical measurements like body temperature, uh, sorry, uh, body temperature and yes, blood pressure and pulse because if people's blood pressure is also increases, their pulse increases, could also have some relation. And there is a layer which then combines all this data and it generates an alert to say if there is a risk of uh, uh, basically agitation. And the hidden market models are obviously you need some sample data, you need some labels. When we started doing this, uh, obviously nobody had done before a similar thing. We didn't have any training data, we didn't have any seed data. Again, we asked our clinicians, we gave, we sent them an Excel file, we said we are monitoring these markers, and if you can you just add some samples, you say, if you see this number of level of movement, this X level of uh, this, you will say this is an agitation, this is not an agitation. We created a system and then uh, we didn't integrate it into our alerts. We have a, a, a mechanism what, at what stage we make, a, we make an alert available to our clinicians and there are different stages. For this machine learning, we created an alert which was we call it an ML alert. That means our clinicians didn't need to take an action on it. But we ask them, if they're calling our uh, patients or their carers for any other reason, for any other health-related reason or contacting, if our algorithm has generated an alert saying this is agitation, also ask them if they were agitated or if they, they, they were agitated three hours ago. And if it was correct or not, uh, basically had, give us an indication this was a correct detection, this was a wrong detection. Over a few months' time, this happened a few times, our, uh, our clinical team called patients for different reasons and they, there were some alerts and they labeled the data for us. Basically they said this was correct or this was correct. And as soon as it happened, we had some seed data. We went and retrained our models. And once you retrain your model, we introduced it in our system and over time we have retrained it to make it uh, more and more accurate. Now we have a system which detects agitation. Still there are some false positives, I'm not saying it's 100% correct. But uh, a few months ago, I, uh, I was talking to one of our participants, sometimes they come to our events, and he was asking me how do we detect when he's agitated. He said a few times he has received a call from our clinical team, he was very happy with that, but he was asking me how do we detect it. And it really, I was, of myself, I was amazed, you just some very simple information, some data, my colleagues have managed to create an algorithm which works, something which I never thought actually we can. Detect. That was again, you can use some simple markers to create some really interesting applications. And over time, as we progress, we uh, hoping we will collect more data and they are improve our algorithms. They are making them uh, uh, better and better as much as uh, we can. Uh, part of this uh, information uh, uh, collection and detection relied on a sensor. We worked with uh, one of our industry partners. They had this treasure map and uh, uh, it's detecting, like we're trying to detect when people are asleep on the bed. There was a problem with that sensor, and, but it wasn't with the sensor, it's just with the nature of how it worked. It was a switch and on and off switch, basically. And the problem was when people were moving on the bed, the switch would go on and off. They'd say, like, on the bed, not in the bed. Uh, uh, and that wasn't uh, uh, good for us because it was basically confusing our algorithms. Uh, look, we looked at different solutions, whether we should change the sensors, we couldn't find out around that time any uh, solution, immediate solution which we can replace it. And one of my colleagues, Shirin, came with an interesting idea. She said, uh, well, we have movement sensors in the bedroom and we have the pressure sensors. If I combine this information, then I can increase the accuracy of my pressure map. Because if pressure map goes off, maybe people are moving, 
But if people have left the bed, probably the movement sensor should detect the movement. And if it didn't detect movement, that means that pressure sensor is just sizing some movement, hasn't been someone really leaving the bed. And by combining that information, first we uh, improve the quality of how much accurate, how accurately we're detecting whether people are sleeping on the bed or not sleeping in the bed. Same time, that also led to another side product of it, because then we could detect the cases which the sensors started going on and off, but the movement sensor didn't show any movement. It means people were still in the bed, but the sensor was going on and off. That meant people were not sleeping very deeply, they were moving. And that also we used it as very, very simple, naive, I'm not saying there are much sophisticated ways of doing it, but very naive way of looking at the quality of the sleep. Because if people are moving a lot, maybe the quality of the sleep uh, is uh, it changes. And then we have, uh, in, in, during the first phase of our trial, we had an avatar which ran on a, 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 a tablet, which like you can program it, ask questions. We asked three simple questions from our participants. How did they sleep last night? How did they feel today? And I can't remember the third question, but they answered the question. Also, we, uh, 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 we gave different alternatives. People didn't have to use the avatar. They could also use a mobile phone to answer the same questions. Depending on what they prefer, we, we allowed them to use different. But the results, again, was going through the common language. It didn't matter you answer, you speak to an avatar telling me how you sleep, or you use a mobile phone to say you didn't sleep well or you slept. But for our system, which was picking up with the information. We use that data when people reporting their sleep quality to measure also to see how good this algorithm works and how uh, it was like 80 something, 87% correct uh, uh, in terms of the quality of the sleep or the way we're detecting people's sleep uh, compared to what they were answering the next day. If someone answered a question, we went and looked at how they slept last night, we went and looked at how we were, our algorithm were detecting their sleep quality, and we looked at it seemed like there was a correlation around 80% in our uh, algorithms. The last algorithm uh, I'm going to talk about today is urinary tract infection. Uh, UTIs uh, are a uh, lot like uh, one of the top five reasons in people with dementia uh, to be admitted to hospital. If you detect them early, uh, it just they, people can go and see their GP. They get some antibiotics, and it, it can be re, uh, resolved. Uh, if it gets undiagnosed, uh, it can result in complex conditions. People might get uh, delirium. They will show it as, as confusion. It may end up in hospital admissions. In some cases, people might spend two, ten days, two weeks in, in hospital. Uh, we're looking if there is a solution we can detect uh, UTI. Uh, Around that time, we went and looked at how doctors would detect, obviously, the most sophisticated one probably is a lot using the blood test, if I'm not mistaken, but they used urine samples. They had this dip test, they put just in a urine uh, sample and they changed the color. And by looking at the color, they would detect. These tests are not very accurate, and sometimes they might need to repeat it. And I've seen now new versions of it, actually, people can take it at home, just put it in a urine sample, take a mobile picture, and an app will actually either send it the information or will detect looking at the color test. But we wanted to make this more automated, more passive, something which we can use the information we have collected. Again, we talked to our clinical colleagues and we asked them what would be the symptoms of if someone has a urinary tract infection. Uh, one of my colleagues said, well, uh, if, if someone has a UTI, number of times they go to the bathroom will increase. We put sensors on the door in the bathroom and we count the number of times people go to the bathroom and we look at the increase in the number. It doesn't matter if someone goes five times or ten times for the algorithm, it doesn't matter. What the algorithm is sensitive to is to the increase of that. It's the number of times people go, it starts suddenly increasing. If people have an infection, they will have a little temperature. We ask them to monitor their body temperature once a day, then we have that marker, we can use the body temperature. Uh, they monitor uh, people's sleep quality, if they have delirium they, uh, or, or, or some of the signs of, uh, of this, the movement patterns, the sleep patterns could change, we use it as, as a marker. We have uh, several markers and then again we started creating a, a supervised machine learning, at some point we used unsupervised clustering mechanism uh, to, to collect some early labels and then we have moved to a supervised machine learning to detect UTIs. Basically we uh, started Try several algorithms. The very early version, we used sample vector machines. Uh, then we moved from that to uh, a, a clustering uh, algorithm. 
And recently they have redesigned it using, just as I mentioned, uh, a Gaussian process with logistic regression for detecting the cases. Uh, around the time we completed the algorithm, uh, the previous version which used the unsupervised learning, we had around 40 participants in our trial, and we had four months before we ended the trial to test this. And around that time, uh, our algorithm detected around uh, six cases of UTL, four or six, five, five cases of UTI. And in a period of five months, if you have 40 people, it's around 10-11%. Uh, and the prevalence of UTI, I don't have the statistics, I'm not a medic, but could be around probably 15 to 20 percent. Uh, well, in elderly people, it would be around 11, 12 percent, but maybe in the demography of our patients would be a little higher. But I think we detected most of the cases which could have, could have occurred statistically if you look at the data. And then we, later on, once you detect the cases, now you have more training data. You have more samples which we can use that data to train it. And I briefly mentioned yesterday how now we are combining semi-supervised, uh, unsupervised, and supervised machine learning to improve the performance of our algorithm. Look at most of the things I explained in our uh, healthcare scenario has focused so far mainly here on detecting cases. We are looking at the data, we are extracting patterns, we are detecting cases. More and more we collect data, we are moving to become more uh, predictive, because once you have data, now you can start thinking of designing more predictive models. Then I wanted to also mention in IoT scenarios, sometimes you might look at cases at different times differently. Sometimes you are designing cases to be able to extract information, look at the data, look at what's happening. Once you have learned enough about that environment and what's happening, you might start thinking of uh, creating, uh, depending on application, creating something which uh, looks at predictive models and trying to predict. In healthcare, it would be uh, very complex to do that, especially if people have multiple underlying conditions. It's not an easy thing to say, oh, I've collected something I can predict. But you can uh, improve it, uh, even with the small uh, we are doing it, still I think we have a significant uh, improvement in people's health and uh, well-being. Uh, there are lots of challenges to do that. I briefly mentioned some of them, but there are lo lots of other uh, challenges. When you're collecting data in the world, there are lots of missing values. Uh, when the good is coming from, uh, uh, when I say it was well, in an uncontrolled environment, when you deploy the sensors, there are lots of missing values. Quality becomes an issue. Uh, uh, compliance is a big issue. Uh, uh, like, uh, if you're asking people to wear a device, carry a device, making sure people wear that. I don't know how many of you have tried to wear one of these variables, and after two weeks you throw it away, you get tired of it. All of us we do. And asking people to wear something for you need to think of the usability, battery life of, of those devices. And the more we can make this more passive, more uh, blended, integrated into, uh, into day-to-day -day living, they increase the chance. But then you have lots of other problems, like people who have visitors, the sensors will change, uh, people will have pets around the house, the design of the house will be different, what you're deploying it will be different, and you will get lots of, lots of noisy data. But in our case, it should, if you try to use that information, even with that noisy data, still you can extract some really interesting insights to, to the data. Just to sum it up, uh, uh, we looked at like technology, sensors, how they send information, and we discussed, we said the uh, power usually, and energy efficiency is one of the key issues. We looked at different uh, representation of data, uh, analysis of data, and how they can be used in uh, different applications. We discussed some of the challenges of in this data. I showed you some real examples of how these challenges can be uh, relevant when you're working with real case scenarios. And also when you're collecting continuous data, sometimes it's difficult. Every piece of information could be important. You're collecting someone's pulse data, every piece of information could tell you something. And sometimes it's challenging to decide what is the noise data, what you should use, how much you should aggregate, how much you should uh, process that data, and so on. Uh, a few things I didn't mention about our study, but it's are important, I like, uh, Privacy and security obviously is this very complex scenario when you're collecting sensitive data. We are collecting information about people's day-to-day -day life, about their healthcare. We had to comply to several standards, several auditing. There are different levels of the security of healthcare system, of audits us. I'm not going to talk about recording this on how we address the security issues. 
uh, uh, but uh, also the information governance is important <coughs> because you're collecting sensitive data. We have lots of mechanisms for anonymizing data. The way we collect the personally identified information, the uh, 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 data we are collecting patients are completely separated. But there are several levels of the security privacy to make sure the data we collect is safe, secure, uh, there is no 100% security, 100% uh, 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 guarantee for that, but there are lots of best practices around and there are lots of guidelines around and we try to add this uh, uh, as much as we can and as much as uh, as, we do, as we require to address the, the, these, these challenges. And obviously the project gets audited uh, all the time in terms of the security uh, and privacy issues. Uh, in terms of the reliability, uh, uh, one Christmas, uh, someone uh, we deployed our initial servers in our the building we used to work our lab was, uh, and around Christmas time, someone drove into the power line of the university. The entire power went down in the university, and around that time, we had started enrolling our participants in our trial. We had around five to ten people in the trial, and uh, as I said, the UPS lasted for five ten minutes and went down. And within one day, I had like 20 calls from our clinical team saying, oh, we can't access the system. I said, I know, the servers are done. I don't have any power to bring them back. And it's a holiday. And that was a good lesson for us. Still, we were at the early stages of the trial. We hadn't started. But security, uh, we realized the reliability and the dependability of the system also becomes very important. For doing that, we have created a load balancer. Like we've worked with our IT system, we are infrastructure is deployed in two different physical sites, all of them are secure sites, and if one of the systems goes down, the other one ultimately takes over. You have to do a lot of tests, and when you have a system in operation, that's really, really difficult, because we had to hand over, but at the same time, we had an operational system with lots of people behind it, and we didn't want to have any downtime. It was a difficult and challenging task, but was an important one uh, 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 to do. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, did I forget anything about Project. If there was any question, I will answer. But quickly, have you seen uh, probably have you seen this picture before? This is a uh, 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 British Library. This was I took a few years ago. I guess by now they have completed it. This is uh, this was built for the British Library in, in, in North of England in Yorkshire, and the idea was they have archives of all the newspapers for the past 100, 10, 150 years. And they wanted to have this matrix to put this, and there's a robotic arm goes and finds information. This is for researchers, obviously, most of this is digitized. But if someone wants a robotic arm goes in this matrix of, I don't know, it was 50, 25 by 25, and searches and brings that piece of physical newspapers if someone wants to look at it. And when I saw this picture, I was thinking, you're collecting lots of data from our physical environment, we use it for different applications. How much effort we put to make this data available for the future generations, because we collect lots of data about our cities, how the environment has changed, how the patterns has changed, how like, people always dispute this climate change. If we had like, data for the past, uh, I don't know, the five decades, ten decades, or hundred years ago, we could put everything together, which we do, we do good, but some people don't believe it. Uh, we could have better evidence, better things to make, make better decisions and understand the changes over time. Which are thinking lots of things you have seen today of data integration, uh, creating metadata, making data accessible. Sometimes we feel, well, why should I do that? I will just add CSV, solve my problems, uh, and my system works. Why should I add all those things? But maybe that gives you an idea. It's not just what we do in future, also that data might be used for other purposes as well. Thank you very much. Any questions?